1940, deep within Nazi Germany's secret laboratories, engineers crafted an engine so powerful it could have changed the outcome of the air war. The UMO 222 promised 2,500 horsepower from a single power plant, enough to outmuscle any Allied engine. So why did this mechanical marvel never reach the skies when Germany needed it most? As the Luftwaffe's early victories turned to desperate struggles, German engineers knew they needed something revolutionary. The Allies were fielding increasingly powerful bombers and fighters. Germany's existing engines were reaching their limits. The Reich Air Ministry demanded a super engine, one that could power the next generation of aircraft to reclaim air superiority. Starting in 1937, Junkers answered with the UMO 222, an engine that looked perfect on paper, but would become one of aviation's most frustrating what-ifs. The UMO 222 wasn't just another engine. It was German engineering ambition crystallized into aluminum and steel. This 24-cylinder liquid-cooled beast arranged its cylinders in six banks of four, creating a unique hexagonal configuration that engineers called the Star of Stars. At 46.5 liters of displacement, it dwarfed the Merlin's 27 liters and promised to deliver an earth-shaking 2,500 horsepower. Later versions aimed for an almost unbelievable 3,000. The mathematics of its design were staggering. Each cylinder displaced nearly 2 liters with a bore of 135 millimeters and a stroke of 135 millimeters. A perfect square configuration designed for high RPM operation. The six-cylinder banks were arranged at 60-degree intervals around the crankcase, creating a remarkably compact package for its displacement. This wasn't just clever packaging, it was an attempt to achieve the power destiny that Germany desperately needed to match American radials while maintaining the streamlined cowlings possible with liquid cooling. Imagine strapping this Colossus to a Fokker Wolfta 152 or the proposed Junkers U-288 bomber. With the UMO's 222's thunderous power, these aircraft could have climbed faster, flown higher, and carried heavier loads than anything in the Allied arsenal. This wasn't just an engine. It was meant to be the beating heart of the Luftwaffe's resurrection. The U-288 in particular was designed around the UMO 222 from the start. With two of these engines, it could have carried 3,600 kilograms of bombs at speeds exceeding 600 kilometers per hour, performance that would have made it nearly untouchable by Allied interceptors of the era. But from the moment work began in 1937, the UMO 222 fought its creators at every turn. The radical six-bank design that made it so compact also made it a nightmare to cool. Engineers discovered that the inner cylinder banks ran dangerously hot, trapped by their own innovative arrangement. Test after test ended with seized pistons, warped cylinder heads, and frustrated technicians. The first complete engine ran on April 24, 1939, showing promise, but the problems would only multiply from there. The cooling crisis went deeper than simple overheating. In a conventional V12 like the Merlin, cooling air could flow directly across all cylinders. But in the UMO's 222's hexagonal arrangement, the inner cylinders were shrouded by the outer banks. Engineers tried increasingly desperate solutions, additional cooling pumps, modified cylinder head designs, even experimental cooling fluids. Each fix added weight and complexity to an already complex design. The mechanical challenges were equally daunting. The engine's crankshaft, supporting 24 cylinders worth of combustion forces, had to be a masterpiece of metallurgy. It required special steel alloys that were increasingly difficult to obtain as Germany's war situation deteriorated. The master connecting rod system, where multiple cylinders shared connection points, created harmonics that could shake the engine apart at certain RPM ranges. The complexity multiplied with each attempted fix. The engine required a sophisticated gear reduction system to handle its massive power output. Its fuel injection system pushed the boundaries of 1940s technology. Every component had to be precision machined to tolerances that German industry, already strained by war production, struggled to maintain. The Bosch fuel injection system alone required 24 individual injection pumps, each precisely timed and calibrated. A nightmare for maintenance crews who would have to service these engines under combat conditions. Consider the comparison with its contemporaries. While the UMO 222 struggled with 24 cylinders, the American Pratt & Whitney R2800 Double Wasp was churning out 2,000 reliable horsepower with only 18 cylinders. The British were achieving similar power levels by simply adding a two-stage supercharger to their proven Merlin design. Germany's pursuit of revolutionary rather than evolutionary development was consuming precious time and resources. Time was the enemy they couldn't defeat. As months turned to years, the Reich Air Ministry grew impatient. Other nations were fielding reliable 2,000 horsepower engines while Germany's super engine remained trapped on test stands, consuming resources and delivering only promises. 
If you're into stories of innovation under fire, subscribe now. We've got more legends to uncover. Here's where the Yumos 222 story takes its tragic turn. It never truly succeeded in combat. While prototypes eventually ran for hundreds of hours on test stands, producing their promised power, they never powered a single operational combat aircraft. The few aircraft designed specifically for the Yumo 222, like the U-288 bomber, either flew with substitute engines or never flew at all. The engine's testing history tells a story of persistent failure despite occasional glimpses of success. In April 1941, a Yumo 222A1 actually completed a 100-hour type test at 2,000 horsepower, running at 2,860 RPM. The problems encountered seemed manageable. Spark plug damage after 60 hours, a leaking injection pump controller at 75 hours, a camshaft bearing block failure after 88 hours. Based on these seemingly positive results, the RLM even ordered the engine into production on April 30, 1941, with plans for the new Flugmotorenwerke Ostmark plant in Wiener Neudorf, Austria, to produce a thousand engines monthly starting August 1942. Test pilots who flew prototype aircraft early with UMO 222s reported incredible performance when the engines worked. One pilot described the acceleration as like being kicked by a giant's boot. But these moments of glory were fleeting, always followed by another mechanical failure, another redesign, another delay. The U-288 V5 and V6 flew with UMO 222 AB engines, as did prototypes V8, V9, V12, and V14. Yet tellingly, other U-288 prototypes had to use BMW 801 or DB 606 engines because the UMO 222 simply weren't available or reliable enough. By 1942, while the UMO 222 struggled in laboratories, Allied bombers powered by reliable Merlins and Wright Cyclones were systematically destroying the very factories trying to perfect it. The engine that was meant to secure German air superiority became a symbol of resources squandered on perfection while good enough enemies ruled the skies. But here's the shocking truth behind the UMO 222's failure. It wasn't just technical problems that killed Germany's super engine. Research by historian Lutz Budras reveals that the project was sabotaged from within by its own bureaucracy. Different departments within the Reich Air Ministry kept changing the specifications, demanding the engine work in everything from fighters to bombers to transport planes. Each change meant redesigning components, altering compression ratios, and modifying supercharger configurations. Even more damaging was the political warfare within the Nazi hierarchy. Erhard Milch, who took over after Ernst Udet's suicide in 1941, deliberately undermined the UMO 222 project to weaken his rival, Dr. Heinrich Koppenberg. Milch saw Koppenberg's growing influence through the U-88 success as a threat to his own authority. By constantly changing requirements and reducing priority for the UMO 222, Milch effectively killed both the engine and the bomber program it was meant to power. The UMO 222 became a victim of the very system it was meant to serve, a dictatorship where telling the truth about technical problems could end your career, or worse. While Allied engineers freely shared problems and solutions, German engineers worked in fear hiding failures and inflating successes. Test reports from 1942 show engines achieving their rated power for mere minutes before catastrophic failure. Yet official reports claimed satisfactory progress toward production readiness. The turning point came in June 1943 when the entire Bomber B program was officially canceled. This wasn't just about one engine. It represented the complete collapse of Germany's strategic aviation planning. The RLM had spent years and countless resources betting on twin-engine bombers powered by super-engines that never materialized. The U-288, FW-191, and DU-317 were all canceled or abandoned. By late 1943, with Allied bombers devastating German cities daily, the Luftwaffe desperately needed the UMO-222 for its emergency fighter program. But when officials visited Junkers, they found an engine that still wasn't ready. After six years of development and millions of Reichsmarks spent, the UMO 222 remained unreliable. Different versions were proliferated, the enlarged CD series promising 3,000 horsepower, the high-altitude EF series, even turbocharged GH variants. Each represented another delay, another promise unfulfilled. The irony was bitter. While Germany pursued the perfect engine, the Americans simply bolted turbochargers onto reliable radials and achieved similar performance. The British added two-stage superchargers to proven Merlins. Both approaches worked because they built on foundations rather than chasing revolutionary designs. The decision was final. The UMO 222 was effectively canceled. Resources shifted to proven engines and jet turbines. Germany's super engine, which could have changed everything, would change nothing. Only 289 UMO 222s were ever built, most never leaving test stands. 
The few surviving examples became prizes for Allied technical intelligence teams who marveled at both the ambition and the impracticality of the design. Soviet engineers studied captured examples extensively, with Ferdinand Brandner himself, the UMO 222's chief designer, being relocated to the Soviet Union after the war, where he would help develop the massive Kuznetsov NK-12 turboprop. Today, at least one complete UMO 222 survives in the Deutsches Museum in Munich. This particular engine has its own remarkable story. It was hidden in a cave at war's end, discovered and sent to the United States, displayed at the Smithsonian, and finally returned to Germany in 1979. When aviation enthusiasts see this engine, they're looking at one of history's greatest mechanical might have beens The hexagonal cylinder arrangement, the complex valve gear, and the massive supercharger, all testament to brilliant engineering defeated by impossible ambitions. The numbers tell a story of colossal waste. Consider that Rolls-Royce only built 301 Peregrine engines total, yet managed to keep two squadrons of twin-engine fighters in combat service. Germany built 289 UMO 222s, nearly as many, yet never fielded a single operational aircraft with them. Each engine represented thousands of man-hours, scarce materials and engineering talent that could have been used to improve existing designs or accelerate jet development. The UMO 222's DNA lived on in strange ways. Its innovative fuel injection system influenced post-war designs. Its cooling problems taught valuable lessons about engine architecture. Even its failures advanced aviation by showing future engineers what not to do. The experience gained by German engineers working on the 222's complex systems would later contribute to successful post-war engines in both East and West. The UMO 222 teaches us a harsh lesson. In warfare, perfect is the enemy of good enough. While German engineers chased their 3,000 horsepower dream, American factories churned out thousands of reliable 2,000 horsepower engines that actually flew and fought. The UMO 222 remained earthbound, a prisoner of its own sophistication. Perhaps that's the engine's greatest irony. In trying to create the ultimate aircraft engine, Germany created the ultimate cautionary tale. The UMO 222 reminds us that true engineering success isn't measured in paper specifications or test stand results. It's measured in real machines doing real work when it matters most. The story of the UMO 222 is one of brilliance constrained by bureaucracy, innovation strangled by ideology, and potential destroyed by the very system that demanded it. It stands as a monument to what happens when political pressure overrides engineering reality. If you loved uncovering the UMO 222's tragic story, drop a like and subscribe. What engine should we cover next? The massive BMW 803 or the revolutionary Napier Sabre? Let us know in the comments. And remember, behind every great aircraft is an engine with a story worth telling. Some conquered the skies. Others, like the UMO 222, conquered only the imagination of what might have been.